Welcome, everybody. This is Opening the Bookstore, Elevating OER Conversations Amidst College Bookstore Outsourcing. Thank you for coming. I'm Colleen Sanders. And I'm Ryer Banta. So for our session, there are a couple different ways to engage with us. We will share these links in the chat, and you can check out our worksheet. There's a Padlet and also a packet of materials. Additionally, here are our email addresses. My name is Colleen Sanders, and I started this work three years ago at my community college in Oregon, which was outsourcing to Barnes & Noble. At the time, the college had decentralized interest in OER, but no formal funding or program. So when I heard we were outsourcing and asked to read the contract, I found multiple things around OER and academic freedom that I perceived as potential future roadblocks for OER initiatives driven by faculty. So I began advocating on my campus and in this region to establish OER um, policies and foundations and conversations amidst these outsourcing contracts. And since then, I've been contacted by librarians across the nation who unexpectedly find themselves in a similar position. So my purpose here is to share the knowledge that I've built through my experiences. I'm Ryer Banta, a faculty librarian at Centralia College. And I came to this work because when I heard Colleen speak and read some of her writing about her experiences, I became concerned about what could happen at my college. Currently, our bookstore is independently run. However, I wanted to take a proactive approach to ensure that our OER initiatives could stay vibrant and healthy even if outsourcing ever came to our campus. We'd like to give a special thanks to the experts that we interviewed during this process. Some of these interviews were recorded and you will see clips in the presentation and others shared great information that informed our approach. So these are the outcomes for our session. Analyze bookstore outsourcing contract details that can impact OER program development. Prepare for OER advocacy before, during, or after campus bookstore outsourcing. Discuss how to facilitate constructive dialogue with multiple campus partners to develop college policies that sustain OER, maintain bookstore vitality, and preserve academic freedom. And finally, Consider how bookstores and OER can collaborate while improving equitable access to course materials. So we think it'll be helpful to frame the issue first with some data and definitions. So when we're talking about open, we are talking broadly about open education principles, especially OER and open pedagogy. When we're talking about textbook affordability, these are initiatives to reduce cost barriers via course materials, which can be led by institution, legislation, or commercial operators. And when we're talking about outsourcing, we are talking about contracting with a third party for bookstore services, usually based on cost. This graph shows over the past 20 years how various items have risen or fallen in cost. And notice way at the very top, we've got college textbooks, hospital services, and college tuition. This produces a very challenging situation for students and their families who are paying for college. Additionally, it's important to think about the impact of textbook costs on students and their families and what happens because of how high those costs are. Many are taking fewer courses, not registering for a specific course, perhaps even dropping a course. Some are earning a poor grade because they could not afford to buy the textbook or failing a course because they couldn't afford a textbook. And a whopping 66.6% didn't purchase the required textbook. So the big picture is textbooks are causing students to make difficult decisions, and this has a very real impact on their success in classes. So even textbook publishers have noticed the pain points that students face with rising textbook costs. Their solution is this model called inclusive access. These models bundle a set of textbooks, uh, offer the students, uh, basically they offer students a bundled digital service to access their textbooks and their homework materials. And then looking even broader, 
it's worth considering these elements that 70% of US institutions have outsourced bookstores that are run by third party vendors. Many of these contracts include OER stipulations and these vendors, they sell OER based products under the banner of textbook affordability. So the point that we wanna make, we want to focus on students and their needs and we want to focus on finding equitable, accessible course materials so that those students can succeed. The point of our presentation is not to add to the adversarial narrative that's out there on this topic. We'll begin with an analysis of third party bookstore contracts uh, in order to help you identify some of the areas of concern specifically that we're talking about here. So what I'm going to share with you is language from the proposed contract that was offered from Barnes and Noble to my college in their RFP, not the final resulting language in the signed contract. They're both different. They're both problematic. Um, I was actually not able to see the final contract until until after it was signed. So all we had to work off of was the sample boilerplate contract language that Barnes and Noble offered us. There are three overarching OER red flags that were found. Um, in these contracts, there's a lot of details, a lot of interlocking strands, but when you step back, you see a pattern and the one I found was threefold. So first, there was language relating to OER exclusivity. Second, there were sections offering monetized OER, and the third were limits on linking in the LMS. So first, towards the OER exclusivity, the language in the contract was this, that Barnes & Noble would be the exclusive retail buyer and seller of all required, recommended, or suggested course of materials, including OER, available for purchase, and materials published or distributed electronically. Now, this phrasing is confusing on multiple levels, um, and while exclusivity may make sense for commercial texts, it does not for OER, which signals a potential lack of understanding or outright open washing and creating proprietary restrictions on OER that arguably even breach the licensing terms. Um, the qualifier of retail is confusing and I thought potentially confounded um, websites that offer print on demand services or that sell other materials to be barred. Um, but the inclusion of OER in and of itself was concerning. And then the vagary and confusing nature of the language just layered on top of that. And to be clear by open washing, we mean to spin a product or company as open, although it is not, which comes from green washing. So it's anything that has the appearance of being open licensed for marketing, but still maintains proprietary practices. So in Barnes and Noble's proposed contract was the direct quote that not all OER materials are free, which was another moment that gave me pause um, and a sense of confusion and concern. Um, and this was actually my first introduction to Barnes and Noble's OER courseware, uh, which was called Loud Cloud and is now called OER Plus. Um, so this is a proprietary learning management system that is sold under Barnes and Noble's textbook affordability program and billed as low cost. So at the institution where this occurred at Clackamas Community College. Um, it was $25 for access to your OER courseware, which is how you got the text. And if you wanted a print copy, they billed it at $14 for a total of 39 because our ceiling for a low cost text was $40. So they priced it to get every dollar that they could while still getting billed in the catalog as a low cost course. Um, and this was a gesture that was echoed in other aspects of the contract as well. So they take openly licensed materials, put it inside a proprietary LMS, which has analytics and a reader. Although last time I checked, and this could be outdated now, you were unable to edit and therefore revise or remix the text. Um, and having the content behind a paywall on a proprietary platform raises issues of whether you could retain, reuse, or redistribute those materials. And three years ago, there were about 38 of these OER 
monetized OER courses, uh, as of this recording, there are now 55. So this catalog that is being sold as textbook affordability as OER um, is growing. So finally, the third aspect is limits on LMS linking. So the language that was in the contract notes that Barnes & Noble is the exclusive entity allowed to place a link in the LMS for course materials, which of course begs the question of faculty who want to use OER, free web content, or even library materials or library reserves in their online classrooms. And the second piece of this, of course, is when Barnes & Noble systems are plugged into your college systems, how would they be enforcing this exclusivity? And I would assume that the answer implies um, analytics and tracking of what goes on in the classroom. So there are some academic freedom components to this piece, as well as privacy and integrity. There's also a really interesting case study in University of Central Florida, where the librarians received a take notice from Barnes & Noble for a textbook affordability libguide that they had on their public website. And when the librarians appealed it to their legal counsel, they were told that the bookstore contract was written more strongly than existing textbook affordability legislation. So they had to take it down. So these things aren't just language in a, an obscure contract. They are not semantic. They do have real implications for practice. I mean, we have Barnes and Noble, but there was no preventing that. But what we what we don't have is, um, you know, they were basically giving us the option, like you can fully contract all your open access needs with us. And like, we didn't do it, you know, and we made sure that nothing was written in that was too, too terrible. So you do have the ability to influence the contract. Uh, the institution, generally will do a public forum and you can notify faculty of what's going on, gather uh, the college community together to talk about these issues, involve students, capture their voice if you can, map out how decisions are made and follow that map, bring in outside experts. I have grown the, the sort of deepest respect for what librarians are able to accomplish, uh, you know, of, of all of the types of communities I've worked with. In you know my uh, close to two decade career as a community organizer, I have um, just been so impressed by what librarians are able to accomplish when they put their minds to it. So I think when it comes to being advocates and standing up for sort of what's right on campus for students and for open educational resources, I've seen librarians be incredibly effective. And the kinds of things that librarians can do is bridge that gap between, you know, the, seeing things from the student perspective, from interacting with students and, you know, understanding the ch students' challenges and getting access to materials and affording materials. And bridging that gap with the, um, the actual issues and the challenges that might be happening from an institutional or systemic level Librarians just sit at that nexus on campus. You know, they're connected to every part of the campus because they hold, you know, the information resources that faculty need, students need. Uh, you know, they they are charged by the administration with with that role. So they see things that people on uh, in other parts of campus don't always see. So bringing that perspective to the conversation and really owning the fact that librarians can speak from that perspective and that knowledge can be incredibly effective. Sometimes the best way to serve your patrons is to advocate for them. Connect the work at your institution to wider initiatives, legislation, or trends. Bring in the outside experts, use the right data to help make the case that what happens at your institution is not only important, for your students, but for the larger, wider picture of inclusivity and access to college success. Every institution in Oregon has um, like institutional statements that have to do with both equity and access. And if you think about how those two goals crosswalk with each other, um, textbook affordability and open education are right there at that intersection. Um, and then the legislature is also really interested. So we had, um, Two years ago, House Bill 2213, um, which requires each institution to have a textbook affordability plan in place. Um, so that means that every institution is like really engaging um, to think about like, okay, what, what are measurable goals that are realistic for us? Like what steps 
do we want to take and you know how do we want to get from point a to point b to really like create a plan and then be able to implement it when it's time to do that I think there's a lot of really great resources out there about what is currently happening in terms of state laws and state activities. My organization, Spark, offers a state policy tracker and a state policy playbook that goes through some of the common sort of trends and ideas that can be mixed and matched and applied. Some of the things that we see are, are sort of most successful is making sure to have, you know, a strong OER definition, providing, you know, funding to support OER activities, and then also adopting practices that make OER transparent in uh, course registration or, you know, the information that students use when they're deciding which courses to take. So as Nicole mentioned, getting clear definitions is essential when advocating. It came to light in my case that all the players at the table did not have equivalent understandings uh, or definitions of even basic things. So communication is a really serious concern in this so that folks know what's really at stake. A lack of understanding of OER at the leadership level will leave your campus vulnerable to third party operators promises of convenience and access to OER and low cost materials. It is also important to remember that all parties at the table probably believe that their way best serves students. So it's a matter of bringing the issues to light so that they're clear and understood by all parties to really move forward for what's best for your local community. Oh yeah, the whole pitch from BNN when we signed up with them last year, of course, you know, me and my OER librarian voted against it, but we were outvoted. Um, but the, their whole pitch was on, you know, we are the choice for, open advocates, you know, like look at all our inclusive access and like, we're just like, we're, we're basically open activists, you know, it's like, oh my God. So when presented with a contract on your campus, you will want to develop a strategy and a focus to your advocacy. In the next section of this presentation, we'll provide a high level look at the landscape. A big piece of this is to elevate the parts of the decision that aren't just profit driven. When a college approaches the problem of declining bookstore revenues, a third party store that offers operations with a commission feels like an obvious option. It's our job to make sure this is a three dimensional decision making process. So as a gift to you to help you with your OER and TA advocacy, we have created a worksheet that can guide you through this process. Many of the elements in the worksheet are addressed in the rest of our presentation here. So you'll be well prepared to use that to guide your advocacy. So as with any advocacy work, a really great place to start is thinking through the stakeholders, who's your audience, and what's at stake for each of those different groups. And with so many stakeholders involved in such a multifaceted topic, don't wait for an invitation to the table. Be the proactive faculty leader that gets the stakeholders to the table early with the caveat that said table may not exist. And, and by table, I mean a forum or a process or a system wherein you can gather a lot of college stakeholders. So your employees, your students, fellow faculty, admins, uh, college boards in the same place with enough time and prep work to have meaningful conversations where you can ask the big questions that are really driving this issue, like challenging the bookstore's retail paradigm given the availability of open infrastructure. If possible, keep OER off the table. Um, it might not always be possible, but you can at least use it as an opportunity to educate folks about true textbook affordability and OER. When doing this work with so many stakeholders, you have audiences that range from students to different types of administrators to bookstore managers and staff. And the question, of course, is how to move them from the audience list to across the gap to the list of allies. And in my experience, the way to do that is shared values. Everybody at the table does want the same thing, want the same outcomes of student success, access to 
course materials and the institution's fiscal health. I did find when doing my work though, I had to make it clear to the folks I was at the table with why the librarian was interested in conversations that maybe appeared to be just about operations or budgets or bookstores. Um, so really starting with shared values and how I can use my skills and resources to help achieve these um, desirable outcomes is a great way you know, to move folks from column A to column B. The biggest piece of advice I can give to advocates is to know your audience. So understanding you know, who has the power to make decisions, whether that's faculty members who have the power to decide what, what materials are being used in their own courses or administrators who are able to decide sort of what policies and practices are implemented on campuses and understanding you know, who those people are and what they care about because you know, open educational resources or any affordable, affordability initiative, it needs to solve a problem. And it needs to solve a problem in the eyes of the person who has the power to decide one course over another. So when you're talking OER and outsourcing, it's a big unwieldy topic with a lot of moving parts that can get very complex, especially with a lot of stakeholders at the room. So to make this easier to digest and remember, we have devised two simple metaphors. Um, we're dividing it into four core issues represented by the legs of the table with student success at the center. And for all stakeholders, we each have three shared stakes, which we're using the metaphor of the stool to talk about. So for the next run of slides, we're going to unpack what we mean by this extended visual metaphor. So the first core issue you'll want to pay attention to is OER restrictions. This is a great place for you to demonstrate the value of your copyright, open licensing, and course materials knowledge that you bring to the table as a librarian. So the next core issue is commission. People may not know that the commission is paid to the college annually, basically for the privilege of doing business here. But this raises an ethical question. Should textbooks be a profit generating aspect of the college? This money comes from the markup of textbooks and merchandise sales that students and their families pay. Is that treating students with integrity? Is that transparency? Logistically, if it's going to happen, can you advocate for those funds to be earmarked for OER and textbook affordability efforts? So the third issue to pay attention to is data, specifically data collection, ownership, privacy, because what happens when you have a third party bookstore, they own all the data about what textbooks, both commercial and OER, are being used on your campus. And they might not be too willing to give that up. Additionally, with any inclusive access models that are running on your campus, those bring up huge sets of student data privacy issues, which will be talked about in the next clip. When we're talking about inclusive access and basically forcing the switch to digital materials upon students and not giving them other choices, we really need to start having those tough conversations about you know, what kind of data is being collected from students. Are students aware and, and, and truly able to give consent for how that data is being used and uh, you know, really taking steps to make sure that our campus uh, data privacy and security practices are up to snuff. Having reviewed a lot of publisher contracts with institutions for inclusive access, it is shocking how little uh, information is in there about how student data privacy is, is handled. Publishers theoretically are able to gather a vast amount of information. You know, where are students logging in? What's their behavior like? You know, what which students are logging on around the same time? You know, what how can we run the students? responses through an algorithm that makes assumptions about what kind of learning style they have. These are tough questions and, uh, you know, tough conversations that need to be had about what is acceptable and what the institution's role is in defending students and making sure that they, um, you know, have meaningful ways to consent for their data being used. 
but they need to happen and they need to happen fast uh, because you know if, if 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 we don't act quickly you know Cengage and Pearson are going to end up in a position where they know more about your students and faculty than your campus does so commercial textbook affordability programs really in many ways are in the data business there is no such thing as harmless collection of data or benevolent collection of data much of what we collect could be used in ways we do not want it to be used to harm or imperil our students. This is very true with textbook affordability programs, as well as the courseware that these companies develop. So the fourth core issue to pay attention to is commercial textbook affordability programs. These may look like OER-based products, inclusive access, and exclusive publisher deals that are made with mostly the biggest publishers like Pearson and McGraw-Hill, and then presenting you few choices from small independent publishers. And this ends up limiting your faculty's choices, their academic freedom, and there's less diversity and representation in the materials. Inclusive access uses all the rhetoric of open education, right? Words like accessible and inclusive are the words that come from open. Um, there's also a lot of cost savings attached to inclusive access. The thing is, most people, you know, who really study inclusive access understand that really this is about prohibiting um, and preventing students from the kinds of workarounds that actually save them money when they're purchasing um, expensive learning materials. So it's the textbook company's response to the fact that things like rentals and used books were were eating into their pro and OER <laughs> or eating into their profits. Um, so really, ultimately, it's not not only not good for students, but it's certainly not as good as OER is for students. So the challenge really is to talk with faculty and help them see through the rhetoric of the marketing campaigns. And um, a lot of colleges, particularly community colleges, um, don't have the library support and the instructional design support that they need um, to transition their faculty into using open resources. So my suggestion is to advocate for, uh, for clear education around the problematics of um, inclusive access and to explain to administrations and boards the return on investment that you get when you fund instructional designers and librarians who can um, save students a lot more money than a, than a contract with um, an inclusive access publisher can do in the long run. So moving on to the second half of our constructive dialogue metaphor. The three shared stakes are different entryways into the topic with your audience. You could think of them as lenses or approaches the mission of your institution, the economic model and economic impacts that outsourcing or OER have, and how operations manifest for these programs at the college. So we'll work through each one of these in turn. It's going to be very important when we're talking about shared values of student success to continually reiterate how we are in affordability connect to the mission of especially public institutions access equity diversity and sustainability this is the piece where as librarians we can talk about the rights that students have to being treated with integrity to affordable materials transparent processes privacy and consent to where the money for their course materials is going. Another aspect, of course, is faculty rights and academic freedom. So the resources at your disposal for hosting this aspect of the conversation are student government, organizations, public interest research groups. Look to your faculty contract for the academic free freedom clause. Um, tap your faculty unions or faculty senate if you have them and bring that good OER outcomes data that really makes the case that what you're trying to accomplish with this advocacy is directly in alignment with all the initiatives that go into your college's mission. Second, the economics paradigm of this issue is at least threefold. Help your administration understand what is being marketed to them. Assist them in evaluating the sustainability of continuing to invest in the textbook market and all its infrastructure. To question the ethical and practical reality of bookstores, retail paradigm, and finally, 
the commission. If we're going to be making money off of textbooks, off of students, in addition to the profit that our operator is making, what is and isn't it earmarked for? And how can we repurpose it to help improve sustainability and equity initiatives? You know, with inclusive access, like we know how this story ends because it already happened with the serials crisis for scholarly journals. As soon as you get locked into these, you know, large bundle subscription deals to digital resources, and all of your discounts are based on percentages off list prices, not any caps on dollar prices, you're vulnerable for prices to start rising all over again. Those savings are only going to last as long as the used book market is around. As, students no, as soon as students no longer have alternatives, those prices are going to be able to rise out of control because how are you going to stop it? <laughs> um, so I, I think institutions need to take a really hard look at the economics of inclusive access. And this is something that you know library advocates can bring to the table because librarians do have knowledge of what it looks like uh, from the, the experience of having gone through the serials crisis. And you know, one day having these wonderful bundled access to all of these different journals, and the next day looking at your budget and not knowing how long you can provide access to all of the, the, the research your campus needs. So uh, you, libraries have sort of a unique position to be able to, to bring that to these conversations and help, help institutions see the long-term picture of all of this. While textbooks may have been their bread and butter for a long, long time, that's not necessarily going to be the case in the future. There is a certain acknowledgement of that. And I think by having librarians kind of get their foot in the door to help the bookstores embrace OERs, especially whatever the campus OER policy is or whatever the feel for the feel on that on their particular campus um, is, they like they can kind of help allay those fears a little bit that bookstore managers may have. And having somebody on the campus side would have been a great boon to them to like sit down and figure out, okay let's not panic let's let's partner on this instead and find a solution so the idea behind open i think is that you're investing not just in that one thing that tool or that resource you're investing in the whole infrastructure that holistically keeps generating what you need when i come to open that's that's my guiding goal is to create a public infrastructure that's sustainable without having to siphon off things on solutionism um, from private companies that only plug one hole but don't really um, create a more fertile environment for the future. That's why you always get a better um, sort of return on investment when you invest in people who can continue to learn and, and grow, or when you invest in an open resource that can continue to be revised as part of the ecosystem. And finally, operations. And this is talking about a lot of different pieces. Um, your operator is integrated with college systems. Do we know what they're doing with the data? And that's your textbook data, your OER data, financial aid data, and students. Will you have access to that data when you want to go and work on an OER initiative? Of course, we want to keep the expertise of our bookstore managers in working with these systems, but once you outsource, you're dependent on that third party, and it's unlikely that you will be able to go back. That includes workflows for textbook adoption and procurement. That's their expertise. And finally, platforms. Um, the operators will provide a discovery and adoption platform that includes analytics that they own, financial data, your course schedule, and of course, it's API or presence in the LMS system. Operations has a lot of moving parts, and this is where you'll have to be strategic in working with your student services administrators to help them understand why you're part of this conversation and why your message and expertise is valuable. The bookstore manager is unfortunately the servant of two masters. You have your company that you're responsible for reporting to, and you have your campus that you were responsible for reporting to. 
And they're not always diametrically opposed, but a lot of times they are because you have a for-profit business working in something that typically isn't for-profit. So it's, it's one of those things where the pain points are gonna happen. There's gonna be a budding of heads and they're, they're, there are certain areas where you have wiggle room and where you don't. Because the store managers are on the front lines and they really care about affordability and they see students with the pile of books and they see the student that has to like take books off the pile even though they're required and they're the ones that are like, let me get my wallet and help you buy this one, you know? Um, so it, it's a natural partnership, I think. So when talking OER and outsourcing, looking at these four core issues and these three shared stakes, remember what you have, they may not know they need. That's about you as a librarian and your skills and your perspective and your expertise on campus and your ability to keep students at the center. And finally, especially for folks whose stores are already outsourced, remember that these contracts are on renewal schedules. So there's always time to intervene and get a better contract. Push an assessment plan. When that contract comes up for renewal, what criteria will you use to evaluate whether or not it's still the right way forward? And if so, how can you improve it to sustain OER? So constructive dialogue is the name of the game here. Hopefully with the worksheet and the conceptual models we've presented, you will feel well equipped to forge ahead. At the end of the day, like being able to find some shared pain points and work on solutions that are mutually beneficial. I think, um, you know, like on-time course materials adoption reporting um, is one that we're working on in Oregon right now. And um, bookstore managers need that information so that they can, you know, be in compliance with federal policy and report um, the data they need to manage their inventory, like the sooner the better in terms of getting that information, but also OER champions want that information to see if there's a library ebook available or who's using OER that we didn't previously know about, or like who has a really expensive textbook that, you know, we might be able to talk to um, about making a change. So, you know, finding those areas um, to start to, you know, build around shared, shared needs, shared interests, shared challenges. What it comes down to in terms of an, a librarian approaching a bookstore manager, um, it might require a little bit of research on the uh, librarian's part. Learn about the bookstore a little bit. Um, is it a fall run bookstore? Is it a Barnes and Noble run bookstore? Do you, you know, is, you know, fall at discover in a, uh, you know, active on your campus is, um, whatever the Barnes and Noble version of it is. Cause I don't remember what the name of it is. Um, find out a little bit about your bookstore and that will kind of help you know where the pain points are. If it's a bookstore that doesn't have Fall at Discover, know that, you know, getting those OERs listed and listed correctly is going to be a bit more of a time consuming process. Um, if, if they have Fall at Discover, it should be, it should be relatively easy and most of the onus is actually on the faculty member to make sure that they get that book entered correctly. Um, you another good approach um, would be to partner with a faculty member who uses OERs um, and you know see kind of you know maybe piggyback off their relationship with your bookstore manager because ultimately everybody has the same goal and that's getting the students to graduate. <laughs> A great example of involving students in the advocacy process comes from the OER librarian at Lane Community College, Maggie Wright, who is cited in our references list uh, and did a wonderful job of holding public forums with student government and really capturing the student voice to show that the choice between fiscal health and student access to course materials is a false binary. We're searching for new models of course materials delivery. The bookstore's purpose will remain, its personnel, expertise, 
infrastructure and systems will be repurposed, revised, and remixed. The very reason we face outsourcing is because the textbook industry and markets are failing. But then what? Propose new models, find proof of concept, pair critical analysis with constructive additions. So we're all seeking innovative models and proofs of concept of how we can repurpose, which is to say upcycle, all the infrastructure, positions, skills, and data that go along with our current bookstores. And I want to point you to Open Oregon Educational Resources has recently put out a couple awesome webinars um, and articles on the topic that really evidence some folks who are doing great work and have those proofs of concept in the field. But when I zoom back and I think about all the student services and faculty support services that the college does, it's possible to see how they could be repurposed and repackaged in a future facing kind of one stop shop, for lack of a better term, that handles all these various course materials and course design functions. And under the banner of open educational resources and all that invisible value long term that comes with it in the form of open pedagogy and engagement and improved course outcomes and course design, you begin to see how there might be options in place with what already exists on the ground but reworked and reconceptualized. Coming back to institutional missions, I think is always a good place to start. And, you know, at the end of the day, what we're trying to accomplish is to get every student who's taking a course access to the materials that they need in order to succeed in that course. And to ultimately get those students through their degree pathway to earn a credential that, that they can then apply in, in the workforce. Like that's why we do higher education. Clear argument of like, you know, the expression that nobody ever wants to hear again, like now more than ever, you know, <laughs> like students need affordable textbooks. Like it's really um, apparent that this is the moment to make college more accessible to people um, and more affordable. So, you know, um, in terms of like making a case for statewide funding, um, you know, to provide capacity at the state level where we might be losing it at the campus level because enrollments are falling and, um, you know, we're losing staff. Ultimately, you're there for the students. If it weren't for the students, none of us would have jobs. And so we want to do, we want to do whatever it takes to, or we should want to do whatever it takes to ensure that students are successful and that students are getting an education that is going to not just benefit themselves, but benefit their communities, benefit their you know, states, benefit the country as a whole. But we also have to, as a community, understand why we think this matters. And that's about tying it to that first question of what's at stake. We need people to understand that it's great if you're increasing the throughput rates in this course, and it's great if you're bringing down the cost of this textbook. And, but these are part of a larger movement, which is where we say we believe that education is a right. And we believe that the only way to make sure that everybody has access to it is to build a public infrastructure. Um, and we also believe that knowledge will be enriched by the diversity of people who can participate so you're gonna get not only more educated people, but you're going to get a better quality of knowledge. That's important when you're thinking about things like how to solve a global pandemic, right? Thank you. Thank you for coming. We look forward to your questions in chat.